your friendly neighborhood autistic woman visiting you today wanting to talk about theory of mind and um, theory of mind is abbreviated in my notes as TOM and I'm just crossing my fingers that I won't accidentally say something like Tom is a disability and defend all the Toms of the world <laughs> and um, the cat is here to distract me and there's some power tools going on outside um, silent at the moment I think it's just hammering I can hear but um, anyway I'll do my best uh, I've been in bed for a few days feeling pretty exhausted and anxious and I'm probably going to bed right after I have succeeded in making this video this is going to be part one of two but I'm planning to upload them both together so theory of mind is essentially the awareness that other people have a mind just as you do and yet their mind is their own and so they have thoughts and beliefs and emotions and desires and intentions which could be and often are different from your own so it's a it children develop this understanding I don't think they really know exactly what a human infant is born with in terms of theory of mind uh, from what I've read there are some indication that they see hints of it in some infants but it is expected to be something that develops and improves over a certain time period and not seeing signs of it is is often one of the um, one of the flags for autism although having said that um, I think we need to be a little bit careful about getting too rigid in our ideas of what timelines infants and children are supposed to be on as they develop and the development of theory of mind is known to be linked to culture so that apparently in more um, collectivism collectivist cultures theory of mind develops more slowly in children than it does in the more individualized cultures um, I do not know a lot about that sounds fascinating though sounds like something I'd like to read about um, but anyway so there's there's some degree of it being attached to culture obviously it is something that is somewhat learned through the environment and the experiences within that environment although it is still expected to develop sort of instinctively and we have an idea in mind of what timeline it should be on and, and where it should go and autistic people generally are impaired when compared to this timeline autistic people have a poorly functioning theory of mind but they do develop it and as long as there isn't um, an intellectual disability as well they can be more specifically taught it than is maybe required for a neurotypical child and many intelligent autistic children sort of figure it out and begin to teach themselves it's not to say that after all this teaching there aren't still impairments that qualify them to be diagnosed autistic there are but it can the situation can be improved all autistic people have some degree of impairment in theory of mind although um, the diagnosis I have which is a autistic level one and is equivalent to what used to be called Asperger's syndrome there's generally no language delay um, and language and theory of mind are quite intertwined you use it to express it and understand it and and the development of the two are somewhat coordinated so in children who are autistic but do not have language difficulties and delays um, theory of mind may develop a little bit more quickly or more easily um, but the non-verbal aspects of communication are challenging for autistic people no matter what their diagnostic level and uh, because that's a big portion of what autism is and so understanding what's going on in someone else's mind based on their not only their words but their body language and their facial expressions tone of voice 
and everything that might allow you to do what we call reading between the lines, in all autistic people that is impaired and causes challenges. And um, if there's no intellectual impairment, there's a better chance of improving it or coping or hiding it. <laughs> But it's debatable as to whether or not that makes your experience as an autistic person more or less severe. I've seen estimates that indicate that humans use non-verbal language 70 to 90 percent of the time and that the actual words make up a very small portion of our communication. And um, I don't know which percentage is more accurate. Like I said, I've, I've read this many times and I've seen anywhere in the range of 70 to 90. But if that's the case, uh, and it probably is, it, it's, it certainly seems to me like it fits <laughs> with my experience of the world. Um, uh, autistic people are significantly impaired in terms of communication because they struggle with all of the nonverbal communication forms that we have and use. They struggle to um, recognize them, to struggle to interpret them, struggle to, to learn that they have any value and hold on to that knowledge and continue to pay attention to them. They struggle to use them themselves. So, um, oh, my cat's sitting on my notes and bending my page. So, so for an autistic person, some of the, the typical traits that we know come along with autism definitely get in the way of utilizing or developing theory of mind. Autistic people typically make little or no eye contact. Um, and it often turns out that those who appear to be making eye contact are actually kind of faking it. Um, I know I do this. Um, they've found a spot on your face that they can stare at that, you know, looks to you like they're making eye contact with you, but they're actually not, or they may do a lot of look quickly and look away. Um, we all vary to some degree on, on how much eye contact we can make and how difficult it is for us. There are a few autistic people I've, I've heard say um, that they actually have no problem with it at all. I, now that's as adults, they may have had problems as children and they may have been able to develop a certain degree of comfort with it. I can do it, but it's very uncomfortable. And depending on how comfortable I am um, in a situation, I may lose my ability to do it or to sustain it. And like I said, I have lots of cheats where I look at your nose instead <laughs> or your eyebrows or something. Um, so if you're not making eye contact with someone, if you're not aware that you need to look at them, to catch their facial expressions and their gestures and their body language, you're going to be missing a good part of their communication. Um, and even if you have sort of learned by rote to do this, if it isn't instinctive in you, because it generally isn't in the neurodiverse brain, um, you have to remember <laughs> to do this, which doesn't always happen. Um, and your ability to concentrate on applying the communication skills you've learned can be affected by um, the fact that your focus tends to go inward. There's a lot going on in your head that you're concentrating on. Um, you are having to sort of think through a script or remind yourself of various steps and that in itself gets distracting. You could be coping with sensory input that's overwhelming and distracting you. And even if you are sort of appear to be coping with it, the effort of doing so is interfering with the communication and your ability to understand. Uh, emotional regulation interferes with it. Um, kind of a no-brainer, really. If you are quite upset or um, um, highly stimulated emotionally in some way and trying to cope with that, it impairs your ability to communicate and to pay attention. Uh, many autistic people struggle with um, reading the emotions in a person's face and matching it accurately um, to, or reading the face and matching it accurately to what emotion the person is actually experiencing and what they're communicating. And I struggle with that one a lot, although I have had a, a long lifetime 
and a lot of exposure to fiction and just practice with friends and family to improve at it to some degree. I'm still not very good at it. And in my testing situation where it, it's made as easy as possible too, because it's multiple choice. So you see a face, sorry, cat hairs again. You see a face, and then you're asked, what is this person feeling? A, B, C, U, D. Well, I look at those options and, and I think to myself, oh, my first thought of what that person's feeling isn't even in that list. So that gives me a clue that um, I was wrong and it's one of these. Which one of these? So I'm sort of working backwards. Which one of these is it? And it's not a timed test. So I was able to take a very long time. So the end result was I did poorly not horrendously, but poorly, and um, seemed to have to work very hard at it and was noticeably exhausted afterwards. And so, like I said, that's in an artificially constructed, easier situation. In real life, in real time, I really struggle to read, accurately read facial expressions. Um, and uh, well, that can lead to misinterpreting things too, can't it? So um, let's see. Autistic traits that can also be related to theory of mind, um, traits that come up in autistic communication, are um, speaking bluntly, which of course can come across as being tactless or uncaring or callous, and um, most of the time it isn't. Uh, sometimes there is a difference between perception of the world so that the autistic person truly just doesn't understand why it's upsetting to be told something because it wouldn't upset them. And theory of mind has to be utilized to realize that, well, just because it doesn't upset me doesn't mean it might not upset the other person. But if you're not good at doing that ahead of time, you will make mistakes. Realizing after the fact, at least allows you to apologize and attempt to atone for it, but it doesn't really stop you from making the blunder in the first place. Autistic people have a tendency to prioritize um, efficiency and effectiveness and truthfulness, and so that um, doesn't always go over well. I've noticed that I do it um, sort of somewhat instinctively, but then I catch myself and try to make up for it. But the more overwhelmed or exhausted or, or stressed or tired I am, the less I'm able to do that. Autistic people are also inclined to be very literal. And with literal, literally means um, in reference to the words you're using, so lit, <laughs> autistic people tend to say what they mean and mean what they say at kind of a higher percentage rate than neurotypical people do. And so that causes confusion and misunderstanding because we don't instinctively or easily read between the lines or play little games or... Um, um, you know, expect you to figure out what we mean. We say what we mean. Um, in fact, one of the things that's really, really hard for me is if I need to say something that I know is going to be hurtful and I'm really struggling to figure out how to say it tactfully, uh, I get very, very anxious because um, I know what to expect from experience. I know that the other person could be hurt by this, but I don't know how to say it any differently. I cannot come up with, it, it's very difficult for me to find the tactful way to say it um, because that doesn't come instinctively and it takes effort and energy that I may not be in an emotional state to put forth. Now, fortunately for me and those around me, I'm generally not um, an angry or unkind person, but um, still, <laughs> you know, there are times in my life when I, I need to say to somebody, um, when you do X, it's a problem for me. And I find that very, very difficult to do because my instinct is to just say it quite bluntly. Um, autistic people may also come across as bossy. And this is considered to be one of the um, 
the observable traits in autistic little girls more than little boys because the girls get involved socially and they might actually cope with their childhood social world by taking over. I'm going to make sure there's no chaos. I'm going to make sure that everything works out so that I understand it and I'm comfortable and it's efficient and it's logical. And so I'm just going to tell everybody what they need to do. Um, I don't think I did that as a child at all, but sometimes I do it as an adult. If I um, enter a situation where people just can't make decisions and, and, and can't decide what to do next or, or choose something, I get very frustrated by that kind of chaos. And I will sometimes just come in and say, okay, you do this and you do this and you do that and the problem solved. But I don't do that a lot. I mostly do it to my family. So what can you do if you have an autistic child who is struggling with theory of mind or you are anticipating that they are going to struggle with theory of mind, how can you help? I think the first thing I really want to stress is to not, don't push eye contact. All that you're going to do if your child achieves eye contact on demand, all you're going to be doing is pushing their anxiety inwards so that they are now performing the way they're expected to perform, but they're not psychologically coping and it's damaging and stressful and hurtful and isn't going to be helpful in the long run. So you may have to play around a little bit to find out how your child copes with eye contact. And you may, if they're a certain age and you can do this, you may need to even just be very direct with them and say, um, you know, I know that looking at people, looking at someone's face when they're talking is really hard for you, but it's also a really helpful thing to do. So here are some strategies. You, There's no reason why you can't teach a child the strategy of looking at somebody's eyebrows or somebody's nose instead of right in their eyes or teach them to look a bit and then look away. Um, there are probably more strategies than that, but off the top of my head, that's what comes to mind. That's what I have used. Um, and uh, what I get from talking to other autistic people who were forced to use eye contact is that it ended up being very traumatizing. And so, um, yes, as a, as a responsible parent or caregiver or um, therapist, you need to find out what the child can handle in terms of eye contact, how far they can push themselves out of their comfort zone and realize that it's not worth pushing them out of their comfort zone um, to a point where it's detrimental in other ways, even if those ways are hidden from you. Um, teach your child that facial expressions have significance um, and help your child to learn to interpret some. Um, there are lots of children's books and babies' books that show facial expressions and describe, you know, have a word paired up with the face to say what it means. And it can't hurt to give your child as much exposure to this as you can, just to help them learn by rote, which they will have to do, and even to develop an awareness that, okay, the, um, the facial expressions and the body language are also going to be telling me something I can't just listen to the words. I won't get everything if I only listen to the words. However, having said that, there are a lot of autistic people who say that eye contact is so distressing for them, they really can't take in what's being said. And the best they can do is to not make eye contact and then concentrate on the words. Um, if that's the way a person is, you're probably not going to change that. Uh, and so your the best strategy is to work with it. Give your child the best tools that you can without requiring them to compromise themselves. Um, fiction, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, um, there's a lot more of that available now than there was when I was a child. I only had books to learn from, but nowadays it's considered quite a typical thing for an autistic little girl to um, you know, memorize all the Disney movies and, and the lines from the movie and, and uh, watch it over and over and over and over again. And you know what? She's doing that to learn. She's learning how people communicate and interact. And she's probably memorizing some actual lines from the movie to be able to use them later on in conversation. Um, this is helpful to her. This gives her 
some security. This is a good thing. Let her do this. Give her as much opportunity as she seems to want and perhaps even offer more than she's inclined to pursue on her own to give her that experience of how people relate to each other, how people behave, what they do, um, and what's expected. Autistic children may do these things on their own in the form of self-teaching, um, or they may need you to point them in that direction or to gently coach them through it periodically in small doses. Um, you know your own child best. You'll figure out what the right thing to do is. Theory of mind is also connected to cultural norms. And so some scholars are suggesting that that uh, in more collectivist cultures, theory of mind develops a bit later than it does in individualistic cultures. So with that in mind, it's just, it's not a, an absolutely fixed in stone, a child must be doing this by the time they are this age or else they are broken. <laughs> it's not like that. Um, we do as human beings all develop at our own rate and our culture and our environment and our caregivers and our socioeconomic situation all contribute to how well and how quickly we do develop. Timelines are not black and white. They are approximate. So <laughs> that is video number one and um, only my second recording of it. So I think that I will say bye for now and see you on the flip side.